Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you to the organisers for the opportunity to talk today about something I'm absolutely passionate about, but something that really requires nurturing, and it's not just a scattering of seed that I'm talking about. I want to sort of lead up to the idea that maybe the community as a whole can help to nurture future plant scientists, looking at and thinking about um, the model that I'm going to present to you. As has already been said, it's quite nice to be back amongst sort of my old scientific community. Um, I was a plant pathologist for about 13 years and worked on mildews and rusts, so really perfect to follow Gary. He was talking about the number of plant pathologists who are no longer doing plant pathology. I run now a science education charity called the Teacher Scientist Network that has been going for 18 years. It was established in 1994 when, at the time, the national curriculum was new. And what we do is we create one-to-one -one partnerships between teachers and scientists. And they are long-term partnerships. And it takes us time to create those partnerships. It's time and it's money. But it's time that is really well spent because that teacher is a really, really important person. It's a focus upon teachers because teachers they get a pretty raw deal, but also they're a vehicle for reaching hundreds and hundreds of pupils. And that's really the why question answered. Teachers are school's most valuable resource. They're a, they need CPD, they need to be kept up to date. Um, primary school teachers have to teach science. A recent Wellcome Trust report said that over 80%, who's got children in the audience? Okay, over vast majority of you, your children are being taught in primary school probably by someone with no scientific background other than a GCSE. By the time they get to high school, yes, they've got science specialists teaching them. But those science specialists are very quickly out of date. And so the, the need for partnerships and the science community supporting education we feel was paramount. So as I say, it was 19 years ago, the national curriculum was new, primary science teachers felt um, both lacking in confidence to teach science effectively and therefore thought that they did not teach it well. High school teachers felt out of date and they felt that they needed support and they needed ways in which they could be up, kept up to date in science, which as you will all appreciate is a subject that moves very rapidly. And things that are happening in your labs can be shared with and can involve students and their teachers, and that will be five years, ten years, before it appears in the textbook. The Teacher Scientist Network is based on a model of science and health partnerships um, working out of San Francisco University. And it is that true partnership working. And if you look at the dictionary definition of a partnership, it's that sharing of roles. And so what we have here from the teacher's point of view they are still present. They are still responsible for classroom management. It's not a coffee break for them. You are not going to go in and teach their lessons. They're going to support you in the classroom. They're going to guide you as to what language is appropriate to use with which year group. Because I could imagine that most of you in this audience, if I started talking about acids and bases, you wouldn't know whether a year four child would know that, a year seven child or a year ten child. And that's the sort of guidance that you need from teachers working in partnership with you. And they can help you see where the subjects that you're specialists in fit within the national curriculum. As a scientist, you need to bring something to this relationship as well. And it's that specific scientific knowledge beyond that that the teacher has expertise in. It's often an input of current science. Because, as I've said, teachers find it remarkably difficult to keep up to date in current developments in science. And in primary schools particularly, the importance of planning experiments and guiding teachers on how to do thorough investigative science is really, really important. And as a network that we have in Norfolk, um, we're able to support both the teachers and the scientists. We got our, our network together and we did a survey and said, OK, so what's so good about being in TSM? Why, why do you like it so much? Why do you give up your time? I haven't got time to go into detail about the specific things, but what I'd like you to notice is the range of advantages that our teachers identified. 
but not narrow, not blind to it, we also asked what are the disadvantages. And we were really pleased that the majority of them said, no, there's no real disadvantage to us. But you will note, and probably not surprised to note, that quite a lot of them were identifying time as the problem. So we asked scientists the same questions. What do you get out of being in TSN? And once again, you'll see a wide range of responses, identifying lots and lots of advantages. And we asked them what the disadvantages were. And that common language of time, time to have this interaction, came up. But equally, most of them were actually very, very positive about the experience and didn't consider there the to be major disadvantages. But what we're faced with is the challenges that you as a community can more than relate to, and me as a scientist who was involved in this scheme during my PhD and my postdoc can also relate to. And it's, um, it was summarised quite neatly in a report by the Royal Society in 2006 that said there was a real challenge for the time commitment, exactly paralleling what our survey had said, that scientists found the school environment very alien. I was using terms like year four, year five, year nine earlier. Most of you are thinking, how old's that? And then the culture within science. And this is something that needs to change, and I am passionate in terms of trying to make it change. 64% of people who took part in this Royal Society survey said that they needed to spend more time on their research. And there's probably lots of heads nodding while I speak. Really worrying, 20% felt less well regarded by their peers and by other scientists because they took part in outreach and engagement activities. And one even said that they felt not good enough for an academic career because they did so much outreach. Yes, there is a balance to be struck there, but these are comments that I want to see banned to the history books. So how can industry or academia best support partnership working with schools? Well, this is what schools or teachers need. A well-planned session, addressing curriculum need. They need an effective communicator in the classroom with them, and they'd like real-life context for the work that they're studying, and they'd like inspiring role models. What are industry's motivations? Is this what they're thinking of here on the left? Well, it's either corporate social responsibility, the REF or the IAE, where they can actually account for some of this time. It might be a chance to boost their image locally or nationally. It might be used as staff or skill development, and indeed, a number of the researchers who are involved in Teacher Scientist Network are PhD students developing their transferable skills and thinking about employability issues further down the line. One of the other motivations is, in certain regions, people are thinking, well, you know, where are my future supply chain of scientists going to come from? Which is something I know that the plant science community is very, very um, challenged with. So you have industry and academia, you have school, and you have a certain tension between them. And that's so industry's solution to this is parachute someone in, spend an hour with the kids, parachute them out, don't have to see them again. Yeah, that's nice and easy for industry and academia. Where are the benefits to school? They're very few and far between. If you do parachute people in like that, yeah, you'll get throughput, you'll get high numbers, and it'll all look very impressive when you report it back to government that X number of thousand people have been involved. But are they really quality interactions that are going to benefit the schools and their teachers? The chances are not. So our network adv advocates bottom-up school-led initiatives which support individual teachers and their needs, equipping them to better support pupils of all ages. And a question I'm often asked, we all produce these papers that end up in different journals around the world. So how do what are, does the work that I do be relevant to the national curriculum? Well, I'll be honest, it very rarely is. You are, however, trained scientists who've been through that process. And that basic understanding that you have is central to what you can offer to schools. But so are these things. You can talk about the wonder of science. You can share your knowledge and enthusiasm for the scientific process and the importance of observation and evidence, what one of the earlier speakers was talking about. You can discuss uncertainty, something that science teachers are very, very nervous about addressing. 
We can have open debates about challenging issues in science. And you can be supporting high quality, the development of high quality teachers who are ultimately going to be working with lots and lots of children. It's also a time that's very good for this sort of interaction. A BBSRC survey said to kids, where would you like to get your scientific information from? Really worrying, nearly 50% of them wanted to go straight to the internet for it. And we've all been there. But 40% wanted a visit from their local, or a visit from um, a scientist or from their local science institution. So there's something there that you can hook onto straight away. So what are the, uh, TSN's key factors for success being? Where, how is this model potentially transferable? We need a collection of motivated scientists who want to engage with schools. I fully recognise that doing schools engagement is not for everybody. I don't believe in forcing people into doing it. However, those people getting involved have got to put themselves second and think about the needs of the teachers. They are paramount. A successful par partnership requires joint planning and that shared ownership of ideas and that joint delivery. Team teaching, as Dawn spoke about earlier on. It requires some form of coordination and it needs time to build relationships. So if there are line managers here thinking, yeah, I don't mind my students doing that, recognise it's going to take time for them to actually have a fruitful partnership. So is, we've identified clearly that time is an issue for teachers, it's an issue for you guys in the room. So if it's so important, let's take the time to get it right. Let's drop the parachute model and actually do something that's going to be sustainable and it's going to be effective. Let's not worry about numbers. Let's try and create something that's based around supportive engagement. So here is where I want to plant a seed of an idea that maybe, maybe over dinner tonight, maybe during the coffee breaks or over the next few days, we can talk some more about. That's the distribution of um, delegates to this conference when it was held in Norwich last year. A wonderful splattering all over the country. We have a model, model seed that I have sown. Well, I, I haven't sown it. I inherited it in Norwich. It's called the Teacher Scientist Network. We can embed it very firmly in lots and lots of little institutions where plant science is really strong. We can let it grow. We can foster relationships throughout the plant science community, maybe beyond England, maybe out into Europe, and maybe Dundee will be the point at which it flowers and gives us some success in terms of inspiring the next generation of future plant scientists. That's how you get in touch with me. I'd like to finish by thanking the Gatsby Charitable Trust, BBSRC, University of East Anglia, John Innes Centre, RC UK, and the EU, who provided various pots of money to us over the years and allowed us to continue to this point. I would say that the coordination of that potential model is something that TSN would urge the plant science community or federation to think about, and I'd be very happy to actually take a role in coordinating that nationally with you guys. Thank you very much. Would you like to en enlarge on the question of science teachers being reluctant to discuss uncertainty? This, I think, is an absolutely crucial issue because the teachers themselves and the government and the journalists like to suppose that scientific knowledge is about certainties. Of course, it is not. And the whole argument now about science and faith is a very important one. People are being inclined by their teachers, particularly on the religious education side, to see that faith is something which is important and is important for religion. And those like Dawkins who are against say you don't have to worry about faith, it's all a matter about fact. One of, one of the most significant things by Schumacher in his famous book, A Guide for the Perplexed, it's a wonderful book, it's one of my sort of guru books, you all should read it. Schumacher points out that one of the problems between science and society and politics is that scientists don't like to admit uncertainty, whereas a great deal of what scientists regard as truth is in fact faith. It's scientific faith, not religious faith. And if, if, t if all teachers would be encouraged to teach that what we regard as knowledge in science is uncertain, 
that would be a vast step forward. The examiners would have to understand that students who said that facts were uncertain were good students, not bad students. And the politicians and the journalists would have to start to get the story as well. Would you like to comment further? I think it's the most important question you raised. OK, I can answer it quite simply. It comes down to confidence. If teachers are not confident about their subject knowledge, then they're far more reluctant to go down a discussion-type route with their students. We saw it classically in 2009, Darwin year, loads of initiatives to promote evolution. That was where my Ron Dance company image came from. Um, teachers were really worried about having that whole evolution debate with their students. And it's a classic example of where scientists can step in and work together with teachers in partnership and actually give teachers extra confidence. The scientist doesn't know the context of that particular debate in the classroom. The teacher does. But the scientist can give the confidence to the teacher to help them address yes, that issue. Maybe the Plant Sound Federation and the Society of Biology could encourage the view across the whole spectrum that a great deal of, of, of science is about uncertainty. The most important thing is the unanswered questions, not the questions to with which the government think they can be told the answers by experts. That's, that's if perfectly that, true. There, there are elements across, of that. There are elements of that discussion within the national curriculum. Only <coughs> time and time pressures for teachers don't allow them to cover it in any detail in the classrooms. Um, so for PhD students in the audience who might be interested in getting involved with this sort of thing, during my PhD I, I did something with researchers in residence. So um, they, <laughs> right, so they were based in Sheffield when I did it. I think they're in Edinburgh now, uh, which is a scheme where PhD students go into schools for an eight-week session um, of exactly this sort of stuff, bringing science to the pupils. I found it enormously rewarding and would recommend it as an experience during your PhD if you want to fit that in. I would thoroughly recommend it too. I was regional coordinator for the East of England for three years. Um, how can I say it? The scheme is now dead. Um, and RCUK have now created school university partnerships um, from the same funding pot. Um, it's a shame that the scheme died, really, but um, that's, that's how these things go sometimes. Outreach is also one of the issues under consideration by the Federation at the moment and how we support individuals like yourself. So it's good to know there's enthusiasm, even if there isn't a scheme at the moment to respond to. Thank you very much.